Hello everyone, Duran B here, founder and lead developer of the Scatter 5 plugin for Blender. As you may know, we update the Scatter plugin every two to four months. And with each update, we usually pack a lot of new features, except of course for bug fixes eventually. And this time is no exception. We innovated a few new features for this release and one of these functionality greatly improved the workflow. So without further ado, let's get it started. This new feature who quite changed the meta for pipeline is the multi-surface scattering ability. Uh, let me explain. Currently, you are forced to work with one emitter surface at the time, and this is leading to a lot of back and forth. You need to change the active emitter constantly, and this is quite time consuming, even perhaps a frustrating experience for some. But not anymore. In SCAT 5.3, we wanted to address this important issue because there's actually a much better way to do it. If you're familiar with other professional scattering plugin from other softwares, they all have something in common. They all are able to choose the emitting surface independently from its scatter systems. And they are also all able to choose to work with multiple surfaces at once. Uh, this was not the case in Blender, so we decided to get ourselves at work and implement this ability. And we did it. If you create a new scatter and look in your tweaking panel, uh, you will see a new surfaces uh, sub-panel category. Uh, from there, you will be able to change the surface on the go. You are able to assign many surfaces to your active system with ease. Uh, just choose or create a collection of surfaces. And from the popover in the interface, you'll be able to directly add or unlink the collection's objects. If you prefer the old behavior, the old linear workflow behavior, well, uh, by default, every scatter operator in the creation panel uh, will use the emitter target as your default surface. If you choose to not use the emitter target as your surface, uh, well, the emitter target will just be used to store data. Uh, this means that now you can create a dummy emitter target where all your scatter systems will be centralized. Uh, just be careful to not delete this object because it will also delete the data of your particle systems. If you'd like to change the default surfaces of your scatter operators, well, in the creation panel, next to each operator, you will have access to the operator behavior popover menu. In this menu, you'll be able to change your future surfaces with ease. Note that the Add button next to the System Lister interface will always scatter the selected objects on the immature surface, like it used to in older versions. However, now, if you hold Alt while clicking on the button, it will scatter default point displays on the selected surfaces instead. From there, you can add your own instances in the instance sub-panel. So yes, we did implement multi-surface scattering in the workflow and we did it right. We did it right because there is an important detail you should not miss in our implementation. It's the fact that you still have complete control over your local or global space. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, let's say that you want to distribute something on animated surfaces. Uh, with the naive approach, you will have density issues, because the density of the scatter will become unstable if your surfaces are being transformed. Fortunately, Scatter 5 lets you precisely control this behavior to achieve a stable density in local space or a density that stays consistent in world space, depending on your use case. And not only that, because our procedural features will also let you decide on which space you'd like to work on. That's it for the presentation of this new workflow. Let's plunge in with a live example. Uh, so first step, you choose an emitter object. Here we will create a new dummy object in the emitter panel. Once it is done, let's do some scatter. I will first define my future surfaces uh, to be these selected islands. 
Then I select my future instances in the viewport or in the asset browser, choose my presets and click on the scatter button. I can adjust the density in the distribution subpanel. We can see that the density is stable per surface scale. Uh, and in our case, we will set the distribution space on global in order to evaluate the density in the world space. In the surfaces subpanel, uh, you will have access to your surfaces. Because we are using a collection of surfaces, I can easily duplicate the elements in the viewport as the duplicata will be automatically linked in the collection by Blender. If I want to remove a surface, I can do this in the collection popover interface. Now let's say we want to paint a vertex group mask in order to mask out the density of our instances. Well, in the curling mask subpanel, I will enable a new vertex group mask and revert it by default. I will click on the plus button and it will add a common vertex group across all of our surfaces. If I click on paint, it will automatically set the layer active on all our surfaces and bring us to weight paint mode. From there, I am easily able to switch surfaces on the go with the mode spy menu. We did a lot of uh, subtle polishing like these details. Uh, for example, if you were to remove a vertex group layer from one of your surface, the pointer will highlight in red to alert you, because now this vertex group layer is no longer a common denominator in all of your surfaces. Now, continuing my example, let's enable the abiotic slope feature. We can see that we are also able to choose if the feature is sticky to each surface space or stays consistent in wall space. All features who can have such level of precision will have a local global space dropdown. Let me now show you another example of space controls, but for the pattern feature this time. Let's enable a pattern and create a default texture. Let's adjust the scale and color of the texture and we will see that a texture will be, by default, calculated in local space. If you want consistency in world space, you are also able to choose the global option. So that's for the implementation on the procedural workflow. If you are a fond of or exclusive manual distribution workflow, we have some good news for you, because manual mode also heavily benefit from this update. Uh, let me demonstrate. I will switch the distribution mode to manual and proceed to enter manual mode. And as we can see, we are painting on each of our surfaces seamlessly. Scatter 5 consider all surfaces like one large canvas. The points will automatically stick to the surface's local space. And if we were, for example, to remove a surface, the points will automatically be removed. And if, let's say, you change your mind and much later uh, add the surface back, Surprise, your points have been saved. It's non-destructive and very efficiently made. So to summarize, this new multi-surface ability is a massive life improvement and we are sure that you love it. Please give it a shot. We are excited to hear your feedback about it. This multi-surface ability is a major project we've been working on for this release. Nonetheless, we also have other new features. I do advise to do a quick detour in a very complete documentation website and check out the changelogs to have a better understanding on what's new. In the meanwhile, I'll do a quick recap of the essential changes. 
we implemented new transition falloff controls a bit everywhere in our toolset. This implementation consists of two new functionalities, a new transition graph useful for user-defined falloffs and a new transition noise for generating a more natural looking transition. Now there are better ways to control your instances count. Most distribution modes now propose either a density mode or a total count method. You can now easily estimate total amounts of instances in the viewport or render state, and there is a new max amount visibility feature to limit the number of instances visible on screen. We implemented a new display as point cloud option this display method is quite promising and very useful to understand the final shape of your distribution, but there are a few bug fixes that Blender developers need to fix first because right now it's a bit slower than expected. We now have better camera optimization tools. The camera frustrum would adapt automatically by default. We have a new occlusion cooling method, and now you can choose to store your settings per camera. There is a new Boolean density mask available in the curling mask category. There are new rotation features, such as a new random or surface origin normal alignment method and a new surface origin tangent alignment method. The rotation tilt feature also has a new noise method. Our proximity features has now been merged. Precedently, we had the remove near and lear near. Uh, well, now it's called repel and they are merged together. The outskirt feature is no longer experimental and now is much faster than it used to. In the pattern sub panel, we added a third pattern slot and also there is a new object uh, projection method for the textures. The procedural wind features now have start and end frames control for the looping ability. We have improved the interface. We no longer have this double panel structure and now each main features has collapsible arrows. Biomes are now loading much, much faster. There is a new control shift Q to open a small lister interface. We have a new scale fading feature that is useful if you'd like to force the scenery perspective by scaling up and down your instances depending on how far or close they are from the active camera. In the export sub-panel, you are now able to export your selected scatter systems in one big merged mesh. Uh, be careful, this is quite computer intensive though. Manual mode has been completely rewritten. It has better gizmos drawing and a new clone brush. There was as well a few bug fixes and uh, that's it for this quick recap. I do advise to check out the change logs page to read the full details. That's it folks. I hope you liked this video and see you soon next time.